We'll give people another moment or two to come up from downstairs since I suspect they're still getting snacks. Okay, um, I think we've made appropriate accommodations. I'm sure we'll have a few more stragglers making their way in as we get started here, but we do have a just an hour um, to talk through the design team readout today, so why don't we get started. Um, there are some things to note well. I doubt that anyone will be making any contributions to the annals of internet protocol history here today, but um, do bear all this in mind. This is what we plan to do today. Um, we're going to have the design team in the form of Brian, I believe, give us um, a, a report. I'm sorry, not on the workshop, but actually on the, uh, on the document. <laughs> um, you can see what I cannibalized this agenda slide from. And uh, following that, we're going to have uh, a bit of discussion focused, again, on whether or not the identified possible paths forward um, seem like the right um, set for us to choose from to make sure that the options are properly articulated, um, and that is our plan. Are there people here who would be willing to take notes for this event? I see one hand. I see two hands. Thanks very much. And if anyone could communicate things to the Jabber room as well, I do see a few brave souls in there. Is that your hand up, Gonzalo? <laughs> anyone for Jabber scribing? OK, thank you. Perfect. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand out some blue sheets and uh, Brian, why don't you come up and we'll get started. All 
I guess we'll make sure everybody's awake. Um, I'm Brian Haberman, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm up here because um, Yari, Leslie, Eric, Joe, and Jason you know, punted really quick. So what we're going to do is we're gonna, I'm going to spend about maybe 15, no more than 20 minutes talking about the, uh, the document, and then we're going to open everything up for, for discussions. I, I think this is going to be much more better in an interactive session than me sitting up here telling you what we wrote and why we haven't written something else. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically just go over some status and, and what feedback we're actually looking for on this document, um, go over some of the high-level descriptions of the options that the design team came up with, and go over a little bit at a very high level the feedback we've received so far. So we, we clearly, for those of you who have read this document, we don't have fully specified options just yet. Uh, we have three high-level views of, of what we think could happen, um, but we definitely have not uh, done much in the way of a deep analysis of any of them or really come up with a other you know, viable options. So um, that's one of the things we're going to be looking for here is do you have other options that we need to consider? As far as the feedback, um, you know, other than those top-level options, uh, what kind of factors should we be putting into the, to the option uh, assessment? perspective. Um, if, um, if we have factors that uh, we're not aware of, then uh, you know, people are going to start questioning why we're picking certain things. And I know that some people have brought some up, uh, but we need to hear as much as we can. Uh, this meeting is not about picking one of the options now. Uh, this is trying to flesh out what goes into this document so that we can get further analysis and detail around those, those options. And at this point, the design team would really like to thank those who have already sent us feedback. We've gotten a fair amount, uh, and it's been very helpful. So the first thing I'm going to cover is um, the basically some you know, possible areas of reorganizations, and uh, we have uh, some information pulled out of the out of the document for each of these. Uh, organizational structure is the big one. Uh, that's where we spent most of our time, uh, not only because it's what what I see is more, the more complex uh, vector, but it's also uh, the one that has the most effect on, the, on these other areas of reorganization. Uh, oversight, staffing, and the relationship to ISOC all play back into how we decide we want to structure ourselves. So for those of you who have not read the document, uh, we came up with three potential options. Uh, the first one we refer to as IASA++. Uh, the second one is uh, as an ISOC subsidiary, and the third one as an independent organization. Uh, so if anybody has other options that you think we need to consider, we'd love to hear it. Uh, the first one, IASA++, is, is pretty straightforward uh, from, a, from an understanding perspective. Essentially, the structural relationship that we have with ISOC uh, stays the same. Uh, ISOC still maintains all the funds and contracting authority on behalf of the IETF, uh, and all the IASA staff would be ISOC employees. The big thing here is, is that we would be doing changes to the relationship between ISOC and IETF to make things function uh, more smoothly, uh, clean up issues that we've identified over the past several years, uh, but uh, essentially the, the big part is going to be trying to keep the relationship uh, as close to possible uh, and only making changes as necessary. The second option would be to actually create a new ISOC subsidiary as the legal home, the IETF. Uh, the ISOC subsidiary can, can maintain its own bylaws, bank accounts, charter, board, staff, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the, the view of the design team at this point is that there would probably be a potential heavy reliance on contractors for all the administrative functions. Uh, we could potentially eliminate the IAOC and replace it with a board of directors that has you know, different aspects that we have to consider in and of itself. Uh, and, and then we have to deal with, you know, what does the administrative staff, um, what authority do they hold uh, with, with relations to decision-making authority, uh, both from a, um, you know, either a tactical or strategic decision point. And the third one, uh, for the most part, uh, looks uh, relatively similar to the I ISOC subsidiary, uh, except it's now a, a separate nonprofit organization. Uh, so we would then again have our own bylaws and bank accounts and charters and boards and all that other fun stuff. Uh, administrative stuff would still be done with um, with the contractors uh, to hold to, to hold the do all the heavy lifting for that. 
the one thing that came up was is now we'd have uh, notional responsibilities within the administrative staff for not only the administration parts, but also the fundraising, communications, and personnel decisions. In those other vectors of reorganization, um, I, I just pulled together a couple of quick points just to kind of highlight where, where things could possibly go. Uh, with oversight, that really ties back into what the relationship is with ISOC. Uh, it also affects you know, what the oversight body uh, does with respect to uh, administrative decision making. Uh, and it would also require some level of defining what that IETF community interface looks like. On the staffing side, uh, our view is that the staff side is going to need to increase in some form or fashion in order to handle all the, the workloads. Uh, and the administrative staff uh, could be ISOC employees or they could be contractors. But again, that kind of ties back into what our relationship with ISOC would be. And that change in the ISOC relationship pretty much runs the gamut. I mean, it, it could be as similar as it is today, uh, all the way down to being completely independent and would require some level of, of, of um, <clears throat> some level of changes in how we interact with them in order to, to make sure that we're maintaining as much of the, um, uh, of the relationship as needed in order to keep the IETF uh, functional. Some of the things that we came up with when we were going through these options, uh, the way we would, we would treat some of these things changes based on what option we go down. So whether we're transferring intellectual property between ISOC and some other entity, uh, same thing with contract with existing, either existing or new contracts. Uh, the administrative oversight model, uh, you know, clearly would change depending on what the relationship with ISOC would be. If we're anything other than IASA plus plus, we would have to try and figure out what the what the transfer of funds would look like. Uh, and across all those options, one of the things that I think is is very important that needs to be stressed is is how do we structure the interface with with the IETF community? Uh, we need to make sure that we're we're making things as tra transparent as possible where we can, and making sure that we're getting the input in that we need. So the last couple of slides, uh, essentially what we're going to do is going to kind of go over the, uh, the, the feedback we've gotten so far. Uh, we broke them down into four basic uh, areas, and uh, I'm just going to go over briefly what some of these things are. Um, so, you know, within the general document feedback, you know, there are some things in the document that we know we need to clean up. Uh, we, you know, this was a first pass, zero, zero document, and um, even when, you know, we were discussing this within the design team, there were certain things we felt like we had to get done just because people were going to want to see certain things. But uh, there are clearly things that we need input on in order to, to make further revisions to the document. And I think a lot of the stuff that had come back as far as general document feedback is concerned falls into that category. Uh, some of the feedback or feedback on options um, really kind of ties back into what the analysis we would need to do in order to make these, these options uh, viable candidates to, to, to consider. Uh, we, we know that they were missing a bunch of information uh, that we're going to have to dig into, but this also ties back into you know, what kinds of factors do we need to include in, in the assessment of these options. And I think a lot of the, the, the feedback on this options will help with that, but you know, we need more. As far as the IAOC goes, uh, we, we, we understand that there are going to be changes or need to be changes to how decisions are made. Uh, and a lot of the comments that we received on this essentially discuss some of those aspects that would need to tie back into what the decision making process looks like, who gets to say what, when, uh, and we need to make sure that we clean that up. And then we had some other uh, more generic feedback, you know, either talking on transparency issues. Um, member selection, we, we touched on a little bit because as we were looking at different options, you know, we were talking about board of directors or oversight committees and what were the skill sets we were going to need. Those kinds of things were, are really going to have to be ironed out um, and whether or not they actually fall into our current model for selecting people uh, is, is probably a big question that needs to be dealt with. Mm. 
And I think that was it. I the time award. Very good on time. Good. Um, so I, I think the best way to do this is just kind of open up the mics for, for people to, to start you know, putting forth the comments and suggestions that they might have that, that they want to open, they want to discuss in an open forum. Uh, I think that's going to help the design team the most because we, we need to get some input on, on what our next steps are going to be. Jordi Palet, um, I read the document when it, it was published, so probably I forgot if, if uh, what I am going to, to mention is, is already considered in the document. But uh, in my opinion, one of the risks of uh, being an independent entity is that we will depend directly on sponsors, which typically may be big operators or big vendors. And I am not sure if that, that's good for being an independent standard organization. Uh, I think it's, it's risky. I, I, I have been thinking uh, the last week since, since I, I read the document and I sent uh, my, my inputs to the, to the list, I really think we probably better stay within uh, our actual uh, ISOC umbrella, but just try to clearly separate the different uh, functionalities and staff and all these kind of things instead of going to a totally independent organization. So I'll, I'll say two things. The first one is is that um, you know we, we were taking into consideration some of the other comments that people have made about you know what are the implications of of different funding models, uh, and I think that's going to be one of the important factors as to you know how we how we actually assess these different options. But we don't really want to have a discussion here today about which of these options is better. I guess that, that let, please let's just try to keep this for articulating what the options are and kind of if, if we've got them right and what are the aspects of these options we need to better articulate in order to make a decision. Please. Um, Bob, um, Bob uh, Hinden. I don't have to say the second thing I was going to say. <laughs> um, Bob Hinden. Um, it's not a little different tact than what Jordy said. So. I view the ITF, it's a volunteer organization, largely. You know, we have one full-time staff member, we have lots of contractors, but all the, you know, the whole standards process and the IOC and the trusts are all volunteers. One thing that the document doesn't discuss, and I think it should, is some of the, the alternate, you know, the things you're, um, putting forward as alternatives, because they're going to add lots of staff, will, I think, change the nature of how the IETF works a lot. And it will make the organization similar to things like the W3C, which is very staff driven, you know, probably not to the point of writing documents like they do. But I think it um, is some, you know, I think that's another factor to consider when you go, you know, go from having a, you know, a fiduciary board that, you know, is responsible for the money and, you know, it's going to change, I think it will change the nature of the ITF a lot. And I think that's something you need to sort of, you know, examine in, you know, in this work. Can, can you explain that maybe a little more from my benefit at least of how we would describe the nature of the ITF and how it would change in a design team document? Well, I mean, so it talks, it, you talk about having the staff make most of the decisions for things and only, and having the, you know, what we call the IOC, which it sort of complains about, has gotten too much into the operational decisions to, you know, to having a board that's only looking at the strategic view. So a lot of things that I think the ITF will care about will start to be decisions made by staff. And it, at least that's what I read, the way I read it. And I think that's a very different way than we do it now. Who makes those decisions now? I think those decisions are largely made by the IOC and the larger community. So, okay. and they're they're not they're not made 
they're not all driven. The staff executes what the IOC says to do. And I think this is proposing to, or some of the alternatives are proposing to go to a model where staff makes more of these decisions. So I don't know if Leslie's in line to answer this question or were you there for another reason? Okay, so so one of the, one of the aspects that um, that we did discuss is what are the trade-offs between operational decisions and strategic decisions, and I think that's where we would have to decide what does what does the oversight for those decisions look like, and what would the mechanism be for us identifying the what what would be considered operational versus strategic, and I think that's where you get into, you know, how does that affect the IETF as a whole? Ted, uh, Ted Hardy, uh, so. Two questions, one of which is really to the chair, because um, I made this mistake on the, the mailing list once before and I want to be clear uh, today. My understanding of what we're doing today is we're giving feedback to the design team and that means that we're still in the first design team phase of the, the set of steps that was uh, laid out in URI's team and some later point we'll get to the later steps including the working group, etc. So th just want to be clear that that's where we are. That is my understanding, yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that clarification. I, I, I kind of got that from previous statements, but it would be nice to have it um, laid out. The second point I wanted to make actually goes back to the, the issue I raised on the mailing list, which is in a lot of cases, all of these are workable if you have people in place whose uh, kind of training and experience gives them the ability to work at this oversight level as opposed to the operational executive level, right? So. Uh, a lot of the, the issues that have come up in, in people's discussion have been that certain groups like the IAOC um, have become much more operationalized, much more acting as an executive committee rather than an oversight committee. And um, I, I think I and some other folks said um, that that may be because of who the pool of people you're drawing on. Like myself, you end up in this as a, as a consequence of a different role and your, your natural tendency is to kind of dive in and, and, and follow some process that was laid out that seems to get you into the weeds very quickly. Not, not that I've spent all of my time on the IOC in the weeds. Sometimes it was just drinking coffee and sitting quietly. But the, if we're going to look at the structure, I think we have to look very carefully at what the recruiting mechanisms are going to be to pull in people who are going to act at this level. And so I think that if you, if you look at a subsidiary structure in the abstract or you look at the independent one in the abstract, um, without actually having a very clear idea of how you get the right people into these um, uh, board level roles that are replacing the IOC as it exists now, um, you, you run the risk of kind of uh, operating on hope rather than strategy. Um, and we can certainly hope that having these other structures attracts the other kind of person into it or enables that kind of recruitment, but hope is not really a strategy. And I, unless the, we can come up with kind of a, um, a recruitment strategy that goes along with the structure, I think our work isn't really done. And I would be kind of unhappy if the final document that we started the working group discussions around didn't have some sense of that as part of its um, uh, set of options for the community to consider. Thank you. So before you sit down, Ted, I'm going to ask you a question. So if it's how to do this recruiting, I'm going to sit down now. No, the, the, the question is, is if I were to paraphrase what you just said, I would say that you want two factors in, in, the, in the decision making process. That is a the skill sets needed for this job and an estimate of the workload for this job. So I think an estimate of the workload uh, of the various jobs is a very useful thing to have. And, and, and that's very, very much an important thing. And what you expect them to do is laid out to some degree in it already, right? That you're saying you're, you're looking for people at a board level in one of these who are going to exercise that type of oversight as opposed to the operational or executive stuff that we're currently seeing. I think what's missing there isn't so much what skill set we're looking for but some actual statement of how our community would get that skill set to take that job. Um, and I think unless we have some theory of that, we're just kind of acting on hope that we get from where we are now to there. And that, as I said, hope is not a strategy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Leslie Nagel, and just to follow on to what Ted said, um, I was involved in the hiring of the first 
IED, and I now find myself involved in the hiring of the interim IED. And I can tell you that having a much clearer articulation of what the job actually is, which we didn't entirely have in 2005, 2004, uh, and also some sense of where to advertise it has yielded much more focused results from the search than, uh, than otherwise. So I think that's an excellent point. What I actually stood up here to say is um, mostly as an individual, I am a member of the design team, but some of this is sort of reflecting on my experiences and, uh, and also sort of hearing the design team work presented this way as opposed to being in the thick of it. Um, there are aspects of this that I think we need to keep in mind, including what problem are we trying to solve? I think we haven't been clear in stepping away from trying to define the full problem set. We haven't been clear about what problem we think individual directions solve. Um, for the IASA++ stuff, for instance, um, there are if we, there are aspects of trying to run our business as something tightly coupled with ISOC's business that constrain us. For instance, uh, for fiduciary, for natural fiduciary reasons, um, our contracting processes have to line up with and be reviewed by ISOC, which has in fact caused some, I won't say issues, but has been less than perfectly optimal at times. So I, my, my chief point here is to say, um, I think one of the problems we're trying to solve in not pursuing ISO++ would be if we think we have um, a need to be independent in our own administrative functions. It's not just a, do I like this form or do I like that form? Um, I think we do need to stay focused on, um, in terms of the split of responsibilities, which we still haven't quite articulated clearly, the split of responsibilities between um, oversight versus the strategic long-term perspective of where is, is the ITF going. Uh, draft angle, I asked a retrospective, tried to capture some of the issues that we have actually faced, um, things that really have no home in today's structure. And we can say that at the end of the day that it's the community that decides, but really that means it falls on the, the shoulders of the ITF chair to take it to the community and run a process and try to come up with an answer. And I mean, there are times when that is absolutely the right answer, and there are times when it may not be. And it does mean that as we go along, the ITF chair job gets much, much larger, um, and the basic requirements for finding a functional ITF chair um, becomes much longer and probably not entirely tractable. So I guess to sum up, it's bad when you make a comment and you need to sum up. Um, I think that we need to articulate more of the problem solved by the different models because um, not just to see if the model will solve those problems, but also at the end of the day, the only reason for the ITF to make any changes is if the community sees that there are problems and believes that we can solve them through one path or another. Hello. Um, I'm Jonas Hoinen and I work for Nokia on, uh, during daytimes. Um, uh, the, I read the draft and I kind of like, and I listened to some of the comments that happened here, what Bob said and what Ted said. And I think that in the draft, you have nicely laid out some targets, what you want to achieve with this change. But then you quite a little bit, at least I had the feeling, jump into the solutions which are based on how to organize the so quote unquote company. And like what little bit, what for instance, Ted said, it doesn't matter how you organize the company, even if you have board with fiduciary duties and all that, it can still act as it was the IAOC, because that's the history, that's the culture, and that's what it has always done, regardless what kind of official standing it has. So we have to really look at the how to change the culture, not just how to change the uh, organizational structure. And as a matter of fact, what I would actually say that I would first look at what can be, what actually, which of those targets that you have really do need changes in the organizational structure, which can be done in the current structure, changing some of procedures and processes. And maybe through this also look at a kind of like whatever is the end goal then, look at a transition plan as well. Because most probably you're not gonna do in one go, go to, if you would 
decide, or if we would decide, to go to a indiv uh, completely independent organization, we most probably wouldn't do that in one go. There are examples of organizations, uh, just as, um, for instance, the Linux Foundation, that has projects underneath it, that some of them are incorporated, and they have a real board, and they have then uh, organizations underneath that. And then they have organizations that are actually not incorporated that work exactly the same way. Um, legally, they are not the same, but as kind of like, as you're part of that organization, it looks the same way. The board looks the same, even if the other one is called a governing board and the other one is actually a real board. So looking at some of these things, what can you do without actually organizational changes, but changes actually in the procedures, how to do things, it, I think is an, you know, could be a good task to do while you are trying to go towards the targets that you have. But anyways, what I would say that is maybe concentrate on more on what are the, how to achieve those targets, um, wh what is really needed to achieve those targets, and then look at what is the legal entities and what is the legal setup of the company. Because I think that many of the things can be done without uh, doing legal changes. But the question is, but we might come to a question in the end that we want to do a separate, for instance, separate legal entity anyways, because of some other reasons that are not maybe in those targets today. All right, go ahead. I'm gonna make you stay up there for a second. So what, what I hear you saying kind of echoes things that I've heard from, I believe, at least three other people on the mailing list and that you think that we should focus more on the, the problem statement and the goals first and just for the most part ignore the, the potential solutions and the analysis of those. Well, is the my point is maybe that the kind of legal structure of IETF might not actually be a solution. That may be just partial thing of the solution, or that might be an inspiration that we want to do, regardless what is the solution to solve some of those pro problems. So if you look at the, for instance, the role clarity between ISOC and IETF, what you have, I think, as your target number one in your document, that has nothing to do with the legal structure. That can be solved without solving the legal structure. Of course, it can bring even more clarity if you have completely different legal entities. But for most part, that target can be solved without having a legal structure. So I think that a little bit what Ted said is that you might be looking at the legal structure as an, uh, kind of like as a solution. I don't believe that by itself is a solution. The solutions have to find, be found as somewhere else. And legal structure might be then part of the solution um, if we cannot if we want to move to that direction for some other reason, or we cannot achieve something in the current structure. But by itself, by alone, it's not a solution. Um, and like Ted said, it's just hope that things will change if we change the kind of legal nature of the organization. And that's not a strategy, that's a hope. I do agree with uh, Ted there. Though that I've always thought that hope was a strategy and I'm quite disappointed that and that might actually explain why my things haven't really gone that well in all the ways. Okay. Ecker? Yeah, hi, Eric Scola. Um, to pick up on a few things that I heard people say. Um, so, um, yeah, Ted, as you asked, we're still very much in early stages uh, of figuring out like how to deal with this. And um, so I'm sure there'll be many more meetings like this, whether it turns into a working group or some other structure, there's gonna be like a lot of times to, to complain about what, what other things we've done um, or are recommending. Um, um, I, I certainly agree that like structure alone is not enough and we'll need to recruit the right people. Um, um, I guess one thing that, I, that I'd like, like to hear from people about is that may mean bringing in people to run said board who are not traditionally IETFers because the lot of people have experience running nonprofit boards often not IETFers and I'd be interested in hearing people thought about that as, as you know are people comfortable with that as part of that part of the mix of the board I mean um, um, and the um, uh, and well apparently I am uh, I am making it exciting um, um, no one was behind me before I started talking um, 
Ah, that's Brandy. Um, so, um, so I guess that's one thing that I think be interesting for us to hear about. Um, um, the other thing, as Bob, um, you mentioned, you know, concerns about uh, staff doing more decision making. Um, I mean, I certainly I've done work in W three C, and I think I think our model works better. <laughs> um, 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 but on the other hand, um, there are things that I think I would be comfortable with the staff doing more decision making about, um, and and less volunteer work. Um, um, in some cases, um, you know, some things we've done in the past, a lot of the software we have, for instance, written by volunteers who did a fantastic job, but, but maybe don't have as much time to do it as they as otherwise would. And I might be willing to trade off some, uh, you know, some control over that, for executive control for fine grained control in order to get like what we wanted on a faster time scale. Um, you know, that might mean bringing some of these people in house instead of volunteers or hiring extra people or whatever. So I'd be interested in hearing what things specifically people are concerned about having staff staff versus volunteers do, um, and things that they think I mean, might be red lines that they really wouldn't want. You know, staff to do. I think uh, the one my red line definitely is not having any involvement whatsoever in the development of the standards themselves. I think that's like clearly like something we we've never done and not not okay. But other things I might be willing to trade off. So I mean, that, for my thinking, it'd be very helpful to hear people talk about. Uh, reflecting for uh, John Clemson, uh, following up on several recent comments, I think the most frequent difficulty with IASA slash IAOC so far has been lack of transparency to the community and the appearance of making strategic decisions for the community <clears throat> rather than focusing on determining and reflecting community consensus. Perhaps others don't care, but if we <clears throat> do, then we should be concentrating on changes that would fix or improve on that problem and then evaluate proposed solutions on the basis of how they would improve or pessimize things. Some of that reinforces Johnny's, Johnny's comments, of course. Randy Bush. Um, my first reaction is, I'm a boy. Change? Oh, no. Um, I think up-leveling. We're at a problem where we're at an intersection of understanding our own culture and the shibboleths which we worship, you know, transparency, openness, and I'd like to remind us of technical correctness and elegance and excellence um, and the ability to handle running a small business. Um, that's an unusual intersection as we have proof of concept we're not very good at it. Um, when I look around of the legs of the stool we propose to stand on the only one that seems to have that intersection, strangely enough, even though, well, let me back up a sec. I have an instinct against, oh, we should have internally a staff that we pay, et cetera, because the minute you bring employees and money in, it changes the game, okay? But when I look around to the legs of the stool we stand on, IAOC, ISOC, et cetera, the one that seems to have the largest intersection of cultural clue and ability to administrate is the secretariat. And I'm really cheered by seeing whoever and however you people made the decision to park things at the secretariat for the moment because then I don't have to think about it. And how we go forward I think it's a really tough thing to find that intersection. We're clearly not good at it. And ISOC clearly doesn't get the culture. Uh, Tobias Gondrum, uh, IEOC head off. So this is really just my personal thing. So, so regarding this legal structure and uh, like behavior, I've been on a couple of boards, be it nonprofit or commercial, and the structure really is fairly dis decoupled. So like, boy, I have seen same structure, same legal structure, boy, totally different culture about how these operate. And it's very much more about the description of the role and how they interact with each other, and then the practice, daily life, how you behave as a board that's shaping that. The legal structure has very tiny 
uh, influence, at least in my humble experience. Um, and that kind of leads to the point with the interfaces. So when you change, when you change our expectation how we operate, uh, that actually needs to be reflected in the interfaces that the IOC is talking with, be it the IAD, be it ISOC, be it the committees. And um, so just changing one doesn't help. You actually need, this needs to be reflected that this capability is mapping. So if you want to have more oversight, that means uh, behavior of the other interfaces needs to also change. And uh, last but not least, uh, so this question about staff, IOC, and community. So if we want to hand over more act action to the staff, more decisions, um, I think John Clanson channeled this uh, from Jabber, like today there is this concern that the IUSC is already taking too much uh, decisions. Um, I'm not quite sure how this will play out if we delegate more to the staff, so I'm actually in favor of that, but it will also mean that the community needs to recognize that and probably we need to recognize that we have more hands off. That's just like my humble feedback. Uh, Brian Rosen, I, I have two points. Um, I, I had a call where conversation on this subject, as I think many of us have, and my my initial leaning was towards not changing structure much because I mostly fear what the consequences will be, and we know what we've got now, and I'd rather improve what we have than start over again. But there's one thing that's, uh, that that uh, the uh, person I was talking to said that did strike me. And I'm going to preface this by saying it doesn't apply in the current circumstances. But we can't fire the IAD. It doesn't work for us. There's a process to mess with it, but we can't actually fire it. And that does seem like a problem. It isn't a problem. It could <laughs> be a problem. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to come up and talk about is that um, I, I think that the marketing problem and generating more income is most unfortunately a, a job that needs the right person more than it needs the right organization. I have been in part of another organization that is so different from this, it's amazing, and yet has so strikingly the same problem with the same results and the same attempts at fixing it. They keep thinking that if they change the organization that they'll figure out a way, that organization will figure out a way to raise the kind of money that they need in order to succeed. And the only thing that actually worked was finding the right guy who turned out to be somebody that the organization itself doesn't really like, but he's really successful at doing what he does and their problem is on their way to getting fixed. And I fear that we're maybe fear is the wrong word. I think that we may have to deal with that issue very directly. We need to get somebody who's a real marketing guy, who spends a lot of time making lots of promises and saying the right things and blah, 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 blah. And engineers are really, really bad at this. Um, but if we want it to succeed, we'll have to find the right staff to do it. Brian, let me stop you before you, you go down. So do you think that we, as the ITF says that kind of competence personally? No, I don't think we have that kind of competence. Okay. We were talking about the marketing problem, the raising mm -hmm. money problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. Identifying, the, identifying the person problem. Oh, identifying the person. Yeah, I think we might have a problem identifying the right person, but I, and I guess that's, yes, how would we do that? I don't know. I mean, I think that, that we have a better shot at somehow stumbling into the right person than we do at making it work any other way. I'll say that. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Yariak, uh, speaking as an individual, even though I'm a member of the, of the design team as well. So um, the comments about uh, the culture versus, uh, or the culture being more significant than maybe the legal structure, are of course, um, spot on. Um, I, I, I do want to point out though that, that like when we're thinking about these things, there's actually multiple dimensions. So as an example, whether we do more operational type of board versus uh, strategic board, um, that, that's a, a, it, it's a cultural thing, but, but that, that's a, a choice of the task that they have. There's also a clarity issue. But I, I feel, I mean, we might have 
some opinions about or even a debate about whether you know which one of these directions is is right but but I, I think we at least have a clarity so that's not necessarily always clear uh, what we're trying to do and and fixing that clarity issue uh, would take us a long way into having a functional or you know, better functional uh, boards and and uh, structures in place um, and the other thing is that uh, Ted mentioned this um, um, hope aspect that we can hope to find find those people um, but I, I think we also need to sort of realistically look at the current system and sort of assess how you know you know for instance if we operate on an operational basis do we actually have people that that have the kind of time to, that doing that properly um, it, it needs and I think the the answer at least in my experience has been that we don't always have because the, the board members just don't have the time to to deal with um, all the operational issues. So it's not a necessarily a very well working system at this point because of the confusion and then lack of ability to get the people who would actually have time. Um, Gonzalo Camarillo, I'm chairing the ISOC board, but uh, this is not my comment actually, just to, I mean, with the goal of making the analysis and document um, clear or more complete, I, I just want to re restate a comment that Kathy um, made last time, which is that, and, and we have been talking to her in our weekly calls, and, and she has mentioned this several times to me. Uh, and since she's not here, let me let me um, make this comment, which is that she's actually surprised that she's legally responsible, and she has to sign several things that they have to do with the ITF. She doesn't understand. She has no control whatsoever over them. And uh, it's a bit funny to her, right? So I think you guys should talk to her, like make a list of those or, or understand what they are, what is the legal responsibility and make a decision based on that. Because um, I mean, she clearly thought it was a bit weird to say the least, to, to have that responsibility on her. Um, so I, I suggest that, yeah, you, as I said, you talk to her and clarify that so that everybody is on the same page regarding what those are. Uh, Ray Pelletier, outgoing IAD. Um, three things, I guess. Uh, BCP 101 provides that the IOC can hire and fire the IED. So the IETF can, the IETF takes that action. This isn't an ISOC action. Uh, the ISOC is just an accommodating entity that's doing the contracts, the employment contracts. Secondly, I think it's important that whatever the oversight body is, a board, an IAOC, the IAOC, or whatever it is, that has cultural clue. They have to provide the guidelines in the, in the, in the understanding of what it is that the, uh, you know, th those things that the IED may not know, whatever that person is going to be. Um, the IED should hire the marketing people. It isn't an open to a you know a lot of folks doing this. I mean, if you're going to build a structure, you you have a president, CEO, or IED, whatever you want to call it, and that person is responsible for doing that, and their performance is based upon, and that person will hire and fire those people, and if ISOC might be the accommodating entity that writes the contracts for those, but it would be that person responsible and has ownership for that. The oversight body is responsible for policy. Maybe contract awards, approval of budget, which is what kind of what the IOC does now, with a little bit of uh, a little more involvement, perhaps. Um, and I'll, I won't characterize that <laughs> any further than that. So, so Ray, before you sit down, would would you state that that involvement it falls along the same lines as Yari is finding people with the right amount of time to dedicate to it? Personally, I think that the IOC should be in a position where it's meeting quarterly, not not once a month, and it takes up those issues like budget, policy, and contract awards, and not many other things, and let the IAD or whoever it is run the business. And with so much interest and involvement, it kind of takes away from the that from that person the feeling that they really do own that and can run that. And so that's all right. Thank you. Hi, Jason Living. Good uh, comments are personal, not as a member of the uh, design team. 
Um, a couple of things to point out. I agree that uh, the need for you know the right kind of marketing person will be important, and that might be a marketing guy or girl. Uh, we'll see. Um, but on the aspects of funding, I mean, I think that the cost aspects of this are important to game out as we move through the process. And I think Bob raised that on the mailing list, um, and that was a good one. You know, if you look at it, really, based on the membership or sponsorship revenues and um, meeting fees, you know, the IETFS, you know, standalone entity is not financially sustainable. You know, there's no other way to say that. But it receives an annual subsidy uh, from the Internet Society to help that, um, you know, not be the case in practice. Um, now, where does that money come from? You know, primarily that comes from .org, which is a wonderful um, subsidy for the Internet Society and some, you know, there, there's a lot of interesting debate about the history and you know what that money should be for, but you know I think that as you move down the process and think about how to pay for some of these things and uh, how to structure certain things, um, thinking about revenues and some existing revenue streams is important to examine as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think Brian, you could probably you don't need to stand up there and <laughs> take take any more. Um, comments to this particular point, but I do want to make sure we probably have, we have about 50 minutes left here, um, that people in the room do feel like of the set of identified possible paths forward that are in the document, does, does it seem like the right set? Does it seem that the things that are obviously missing? Are there, are the lines not clearly drawn between these? Um, thus far I've heard people express preferences or express what they perceive to be good properties of some of these, but uh, is there anything that we missed and that the design team missed in this? Anyone want to speak to that? No takers. Good. So it looks like the design team, we might say, has identified a good set of paths forward. Uh, see, that gets people up and to the microphones. Excellent. I was trying to find the question that would get people to the microphones on this. Uh, yes, Ted Hardy. Um, I think that uh, uh, in terms of options not considered, there are a whole bunch of options that we could have considered that clearly had uh, pessimal outcomes. For example, merger with some other standards group. Right? Um, you could have put down, we're going to become a subsidiary society of X and pick your, your favorite X. Um, you probably have to talk to X. It's one of those things where both partners have to agree. That, you know, but, but this is the kind of thing that, that's actually not considered in there, and I'm fine with that. Right? These are these are the set of options that you want the community to consider. And if somebody really has a strong feeling uh, that we ought to go get married, they ought to bring the bride or groom, whichever it may be, to us and and have a discussion. Right? Um, not not up to the thing. But I do think we we have to be very careful in looking at what these options are because they're in fact. Um, ranges within each of these options that are substantially different. And so do I think this is the right class of options? Sure. They're kind of stay where we are and get better, kind of become slightly different within our, our current organizational home, but not change organizational homes, become independent, right? But that's really a class of options, uh, not uh, an option in and of itself. And for a design team exercise, if that's where you want to stop, I'm fine with that. When it becomes a working group and we, we narrow down on one of these, I, I'm fine with that being where we do that. But I want us to be kind of careful about how far we think this gets us. Uh, to Even to pick an option from among these is the start of a journey, not the end of it. Um, and where we are now, I think, is, is an okay place for that place in Yari's uh, timeline. Um, but I don't want us to, to think that having made that decision, that these are the right classes of options to consider that we're, we're much further along than the beginning. Yeah, you want to join in again. Um, so I agree with what Ted said, but that wasn't really why I came here for. So yes, I think these are the possible viable ways forward in terms of a legal entity. But I don't think that these are solutions to the problems that were sell that were are in the document. I don't think that saying we will do an independent entity, for instance, will solve the things that are in the targets. That's a, I think that work is still to be done. 
how to solve those issues. The, the kind of like, I, I think that there is at least a potential to get those uh, all targets within any of these. And like Ted said, then there are subclasses under these classes, how to do that as well. So it's, the structure is, so you keep on showing this picture, but yes. this yeah. doesn't, none of those three things actually have anything to do with this. In anything to do? I mean, Nothing. so some of these structures would obviously radically change this, right? <laughs> so in as a plus plus structure, we could argue, sure, you just kind of point the arrows in different places, but some of these structures would you really might utterly transform be, this, right? <laughs> no. Potentially, yes. But the, the thing is basically, if you take an independent entity, you would call the IOC board and then you would keep everything like it is. You would have the same mass, so to say. You wouldn't have solved anything. So that's my previous point also before. The legal entity question will not solve any of those problems okay. um, by magic, but you have to actually find a solution for those and then see where, what you need in addition to kind of like where that kind of um, contributes that which legal entity that you sure. are getting it. I mean, to, to that, Anna, let me let me just ask one question in the room. Is there anybody here who thinks that if we just, you know, is something that we can consider if we just made the IOC more consultative and transparent, you know, would that alone fix enough of the problems that people think here? Is, is there anyone who thinks that? So that's when we can at least take off the table of this. We need something that is more IASA++ plus plus than that, right, to fix these kinds of things. Of course. Uh, Leslie? Uh, Leslie Daigle, and I, I think I'm emphasizing Yanni's point. I hope I am. I, I get the point. I take the point that just saying this structure or that structure doesn't answer the question. Devil's in the details. How are you going to implement any of those structures? Um, at the risk of dumping a whole lot more work down on my own head, um, among others, it seems like a more useful approach might be to start from here are the problems that we've identified and here are the ways they could be addressed with these different structures and then taught it all up at the end so that we can have a rational discussion about which way, which flavor of a path forward did we want to pursue? Because I don't, I don't think we can discuss the, the trade-offs of, you know, subsidiary, independent, IS++, plus plus. we don't really understand how they're addressing the problems we think we have. So it's like flip the vertical and horizontal axes in the document. No, I think, I think I'm from up here hearing a lot of the same thing from this discussion. I'm hearing a lot of people who are talking about the properties that the solution needs to have more than necessarily should we choose from one of these three things. And I think that's what I, I suspect maybe, and Ted, correct me if I'm wrong, underlies a lot of what you're saying, what, what the properties are that we need to drive this towards rather than just kind of, well, if we create a structure like this, we can hope that those properties will somehow magically arise from it. Yeah, so my point was exactly what she said. Okay. Okay. Lucy Lynch, so I actually think, given some of the comments that Mike, that there's probably prep work before one of these structures is clear, given what Jason said about income streams and history, and given what Gonzalo said about Kathy's current understanding, as opposed to the handshake agreements that were the original partnership, there's work there that's clarifying work that allows us to understand whether or not we even have options there that has to be done. That's certainly true as well, and well taken. Uh, we scheduled for about five more minutes. If there is anything else that people feel we've missed here that we should be talking about. Again, I, I think this discussion about what, what the properties are that we're trying to drive towards is probably a very valuable one. Um, for the design team to hear about before they go back and take another swing at this. But I, I think actually the rest of the time in the session they're going to use to like go do work. So um, if you'd rather just see them go to work, we can get five minutes more work out of them. No takers? All right, well, thank you um, for this uh, great feedback for the design team. Um, obviously, it's still a lot to do here, um, still early in the process, but uh, we'll all keep on it. Blue sheets, please, if you have them, if you could bring them forward. I see one. Do I see two? I see two. Perfect. Thanks so much. <laughs>